Thank you. Um, I'm more than a bit nervous about this talk, so I'm probably going to blather a bit. Um, first, I want to thank you all for showing up and sticking throughout the day. I know it's been a long day, and there's a, been a lot of technical talk here, and some brains are melting, especially mine. Um, but more importantly, I want to thank Ben and Shane for pulling this conference off. Hi. Um, it's an amazing event, and it's just something that I, I could not pull off if I were to try. Um, so I want to give them a, a round of applause, please. So my talk's titled Occupy Ruby, Why We Need to Moderate the 1%. Um, I do need to go fast. Uh, I screwed up big time with this talk. Uh, first off, I agreed to do it. Um, this talk makes me more than a bit nervous. Um, I've done really technical talks before and done them without a butterfly flitter at all, and this is a lot more complex of a topic. And yeah, it's also a 30-minute slot, and I have 112 slides, although I guess is because of the scheduling snafu, the 30-minute thing is not as big of a deal anymore. Um, so let's do some damage control first. Uh, what I'm not talking about, um, this is not meant to be an inflammatory talk. Um, it is not about airing dirty laundry. I will be using specific examples in order to talk the, for this talk to make sense to you. Um, but it's all laundry that's been aired before. Um, I've also heard that some people have expressed disdain for this talk well before anyone, including myself, has seen the slides. So <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Um, this is not the talk you're assuming it is, so please keep an open mind. Um, that said, I think this talk is important and it needs to be said, um, so I'm giving it. Uh, I'd also like to say that I'm glad that Aja and Katrina and others could talk about the nerdly things that they're passionate about instead of yet another girl having to talk about being a girl in tech. Um, I think that gets real old for them. And so... <laughs> so... This next slide won't make as much sense if you weren't here last year. How many people were here last year? I'll be talking about my feelings today. <laughs> Sorry for those who uh, were not here last year. Um, that's purely a joke. Um, so what I will be talking about is uh, community, our community, um, the undesired, undesired behavior within it, and what we can do about it. So let's get started. Uh, community. Um, community is the condition of sharing or having certain attitudes and interests in common, and for that, uh, for us, that is Ruby. Um, so what do we want in our community? I think I speak for everyone here and, and elsewhere that, for the most part, we want to have fun programming in Ruby. Uh, and I speak for most of us, um, or at least a goodly number of us, when I say that we also want to help others learn Ruby so that they can have fun programming in Ruby, too, because why not bring them into the cult? Um, and more than anyone, I believe Matt's embodies this. Um, after all, his design of the Ruby programming language itself, the syntax, the libraries, and everything else, was to emphasize having fun in programming. The fact that we've got uh, enumerators as beautiful as they are and block passing the way it is, is because he wants programming to be fun. I mean, he's designed for that purpose. Um, and we've adopted this embodiment, and we've called it Miniswan. So everyone sing along if you can. Matt's is nice, and so we are nice. Um, but nice is not commutative. Uh, not everyone is nice back. And uh, even a minority population, this can be poison to our community. So how do we keep the community healthy? Um, I think the first thing you need to do is you need to frame the metaphor right. And I believe that for us, uh, a walled garden metaphor is actually a really good one. Uh, and I didn't know much about walled gardens when I started this talk. Um, so in researching them, I found out they were really fascinating. First off, they're walled primarily for horticulture reasons. They're not for security reasons. They're not trying to keep people out from the flowers. I mean, you do get some benefit in the fact that uh, animals that would normally eat your plants are kept out for the most part, but that's not the purpose. Um, the purpose is those walls help raise the ambient temperature several degrees, and they contain their own distinct stable microclimates throughout the walled garden, um, allowing you in something like a north temperate zone to have things like fruit trees and tropical botanicals that you're able to grow year round. And if we look at a simple map of an example of a walled garden, you can see the level of complexity throughout. Um, 
I don't know which direction is supposed to be north here, but uh, if you look at the designs, they often design the south facing wall to have the stuff that needs the most heat because the walls themselves will uh, hold on to heat like a battery and release it throughout the night. Um, you can have things like fruit trees and botanicals and, and everything else throughout the garden and each area can be designed to be stable for its own specific requirements. I think that fits us really well because we have a bunch of different subgroups within the Ruby community. We have people that love to do rails. We have people like me who haven't touched rails in a year. Um, for us, our walled garden consists of the following mediums. There's IRC, mailing lists, Twitter, blogs, regional groups and national conferences. Um, and then, of course, our workplace. So it's fair to say that right now our walled garden is a fairly healthy and welcoming environment for most people and it lets us have fun and help others. Um, but walled gardens require constant upkeep to remain, remain healthy and balanced. Uh, without this upkeep, you start winding up like the Python community where it's pretty cold to anyone trying to get into it. So we've talked about community. Let's talk about what we don't want in our community. This is where things start to get a little messy. Um, detractors, and I think this is the, the thesis of my point, Detractors pull our attention from helping newcomers and from having fun ourselves. Uh, they make things seem less inviting to outsiders so we get less people coming in. But bad behavior is simply not acceptable, but it's defined by us. For me, that looks like this. Assholes, trolls, help vampires, and crazies. Please notice the air quotes and the literal quotes. Um, so to help figure out what that means, I've written the Nerds Field Guide to Identifying Weeds. <laughs> weeds are anything you don't want in your garden, whether they're good or acceptable or not. Um, roses can be weeds if you're trying to grow strawberries. So let's start off with the easiest one, the assholes. They are by far the easiest to identify, and I'm not talking about people that disagree with you. That's not necessarily an asshole, depending on how they go about disagreeing with you. I'm talking about the racists, the misogynists, and the people who are assholes for the sake of being assholes, which can be confused with uh, what I'm calling an uber troll. Um, iconically, though, I think it's fair to say that Zed Shaw is an asshole. I'm not even going to bother reading this quote. Um, I find it inflammatory. You can read it on your own if you want to. Um, and before anyone gets upset that I'm calling Zed an asshole, one, I don't think he would disagree, uh, and two, um, I've had dinner with him, I've spent time with him, and I've supposedly nearly gotten into a physical altercation with him in New York. Um, I'm gonna make a judgment call here, he's an asshole. <laughs> uh, luckily, outside of our community, we had uh, rethinking best practices in Java EE6, Java 1 2011, where someone was giving a talk where he was trying to talk about describing something highly technical. And originally the slides said how to explain it to a woman, and he was uh, talked into changing that to how to explain it to an alien, and then added an extra slide about how it used to be explain it to a woman, so it was at least just as bad. In 2009, we had an unfortunate talk given at Gogoruko called CouchDB, Perform Like a Porn Star. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the speaker had no intention of this talk being inflammatory um, or offensive, but it was. What was an asshole thing was how the backlash was handled. Um, that could have been handled a lot better. Sorry, I'm drying up. Um, he didn't apologize. I'm sorry you were offended is not an apology. Um, didn't try to understand those that he did offend and argued and rationalized. I have a wife does not mean it's not sexist. Um, if he just said, oh God, you're right, I fucked up, bad judgment, I'll fix the slides and republish them so they can be viewed at work. I'm sorry, all of the backlash would have been done there and then. And uh, last but not least, and this I need to emphasize happened in the last month. All I can say is wow. 
And in case you think this is an isolated event, it's not. And in particular, this person is a notable person in our community, and I think this should not be allowed. Um, moving on, trolls, uh, slightly harder to identify than assholes in part because that's part of what being a troll is. Um, I'm gonna use the old school definition for the most part, uh, which is taking perverse positions to create havoc, derail conversations, and get attention. Um, but as my last bullet points out, um, trolls are a much more complex problem than that. They're not the old school trolls we're used to. This is not Usenet anymore, they've gotten sophisticated. Uh, and there's a, there's a very good talk um, given by Ill Doctrine um, that I think you should go over called how to or why we should feed the trolls. Um, it's very insightful. I only watched it a few days ago, and I think it, it broadens the scope that trolls contain, but I'm not prepared to address all of that. And I don't think we have necessarily all of those problems. Um, they are mostly found online. They generally favor anonymity, um, but not always. And our iconic troll is Giles Boquette, who actually said, published, the Ruby community needed to rise up against Chad Fowler, murder him twice, dismember his corpse, set the remains on fire, and desecrate the ashes with urine. If there was a more trollish statement out there, I don't know it, and I don't want to. Next up are help vampires. Help vampires are an odd one. Um, they are kind of like trolls in that you're not quite sure up front what they're about. Um, but I'm not gonna go into defining them too much because Amy Hoy's uh, Help Vampires, a Spotter's Guide did a perfect job, and I'm gonna provide a link to that at the end of my talk. Um, needless to say, they suck up a lot of our time, and what they do is they prevent us from helping focus our time and attention on the newcomers that really need our time. Next up, crazies, again with the air quotes. I use that term very loosely. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with mental illness at all. Um, and sometimes they're hard to identify, sometimes they're really, really easy. But basically, um, they're not necessarily offensive. Um, they just make you feel uncomfortable and distract you on a near constant basis. And in many ways, in some ways, they are absolutely innocent. Um, but they're still not desirable within our walled garden on a context or me per medium basis. Uh, in some cases, they're just fine if they're via IRC and they're not fine going to your user group or vice versa. Uh, it really depends. Um, in our case, we had someone that we dubbed uh, Captain Gummy Bear. Um, he is an ex CLRB member um, and he would come to our meetings and randomly we'd get outbursts of Gummy Bear and Yummy Gummy, what have you. And finally, an extension of the crazies are the good crazies. And I'm not saying that these guys should be, uh, are considered undesirable. Um, we have someone named Ron Evans down in LA, who if you've had the opportunity of seeing his talks, um, they're amazing. And if you haven't, please seek him out and go see one of his talks. Um, I've watched he and his brother have Ruby programmable Zeppelins. Um, he's worked on uh, Raspberry Pi um, in part with his effort on Kids Ruby. Um, he's done a lot to try to bring really creative ways of encouraging programming amongst um, others, especially kids. His effort on Kids Ruby is amazing. Um, he is absolutely turned up to 11 at all times. His talks are very energetic and very intense and kind of exhausting, but they're, they're inspiring and they're amazing, and I think we should all seek him out. Um, and iconically, we've got Why the Lucky Stiff. Um, and while he self-imploded in our community and pulled himself out and disappeared, uh, I don't think anyone can really argue the point that he didn't do more than anyone else to inspire and bring more people into our community and energize us and get us going. Um, 
both of them have done an amazing job of inspiring creativity, and I think they need to be lauded for that. And if anything, we need more of these. They're, they're good examples of what we want. Um, but remember that it's more about the behavior than the person. And I'm going to cite Il Doctrine again. Um, he has an awesome talk, uh, which is how to tell someone they sound racist, um, which is much different than how to tell someone they're racist. Um, and I think that can be applied to anything that I'm talking about here, that it's about the behavior, not the person themselves. Uh, and that everyone should have a chance to redeem themselves. That's very important. So we've talked about our community. And we've talked about the d behavior we don't want within it. Uh, what can we do about it? Um, I went to a little hippie school in Olympia, Washington, called the Evergreen State College. Um, and I learned computer science in a way that worked for my brain really well there. But I also learned very ineffective forms of protest. Um, for the most part, that meant uh, chaining yourself to a tree the day before it was supposed to be bulldozed. I think it's better to understand the system and work it from the inside proactively than it is to react to something as it's too late. Um, Knee-jerk reaction does not work. And in this sense, that's what this talk is about. Um, we have our own organization here in Seattle called Occupy Seattle. And I don't know if it's a direct offshoot or if it's a sister organization. They have the Noise Brigade. And every Wednesday night, they start at the community college just down the street from where I live and walk around town and bang pots. <laughs> Do you feel inspired? Yeah. Um, banging pots does not affect change, and making a lot of noise for us does not necessarily affect change. Um, so let's focus on, on how to tend to our walled garden. Um, I think we should strive to improve signal to noise. Uh, we should strive towards dialogue. Um, we should ban in mediums where we have control, and in, in mediums where we don't have control, we should shun. Uh, I think shunning is a, a really powerful tool that is now really underused in our, our society. Um, but I know that ban and shun raise red flags for people, especially nerds. Um, and in that, I want to cite the uh, online paper, Geek Social Fallacies, and specifically point out Geek Social Fallacy number one, ostracizers are evil. Um, I'm going to try to read this, but between the light and the dryness, my eyes are really drying up. I don't want you to read all of this. I'm going to just point out specific subsets. In its pathological form, GSF-1 prevents its carrier from participating in or tolerating the exclusion of anyone from anything. And no matter how obnoxious, offensive, or aromatic that prospective excludee may be. If GSF-1 exists in sufficient concentration, and it usually does, it is impossible to expel a person who actively detracts from every social event. Um, it is okay for us to, oh, it really did crash, and it really lost my notes. Um, I think in this sense, Miniswan is employed too much. Miniswan is about us having fun and being nice to each other and cooperating and participating. It is not meant to include every asshole if they're an asshole. Uh, I think it can be abused and used in, in passive aggressive ways in that sense. But the reaction to any of these behaviors should be modeled to the context. So when we see trolling or asshole behavior on IRC or a mailing list, then I think that we should ban with impunity. When we have misogyny at a conference, and I'm going to quote here, who are you here with? Oh, so you're a designer? What? You code? Wow. Um, we should shun those people. Ask Hattery on Twitter or on a blog, then unsubscribe. Stop reading it. And uh, something I really want to draw extra attention to, perhaps because I'm giving this talk, um, if you have an offensive speaker, I think you should stand up and walk out. So when I say, can't we all just agree that women don't want to program? Aja is demonstrating that you should stand up for 15 to 30 seconds. Make yourself known and seen, but don't be rude. Shake your head no, and leave. Don't come back. Please, go tell the conference organizer 
why you left a particular talk. They don't necessarily have time to review all of the talks. Um, and they certainly only get proposals most of the time, not the actual talks themselves. They're also not necessarily in the room with you, so they need to know these things. And specifically, I want you to lead the way. You don't wait for someone else to stand up first. You be the first to do it, and they'll follow you. Finally, if you have a misogynistic and racist team member on your BDD framework, I think you should revoke the commit bit and disavow that person. Distance yourself from them, otherwise you're implicitly condoning their behavior. But whatever your action, things not working, whatever your action, stop feeding them your energy. Get away from them, shun them, and they're going to wither. So some specific examples. We had an ex-member many, many years ago, we had an ex-member of Seattle RB who actually said, despite my jadedness, I do think we, it would be great if there were more chicks in programming. I get tired of looking at dudes all day long. Then again, they gotta be at least cute chicks, otherwise, what's the point? So I talked to him that night uh, on IM and via email, and he was unrepentant. I talked to our other leaders in the group, and we all decided to employ the ban hammer that night. I was criticized for not doing it publicly, but my job is to tend the garden, not to flog people. And I think that that worked out well. Um, the other example, uh, Captain Gummy Bear, um, he started coming to our group because he was going to a local Ruby class, and he was a health vampire. He would literally walk from person to person, uh, asking them essentially to do his homework. Um, we redirect, redirected that, and I thought we did a good uh, job of it, um, but eventually he just kept coming to the meetings and wouldn't work on Ruby. He would just look at uh, Google Maps the entire night and randomly outburst gummy bear and yummy gummy, um, which we were tolerating for a while, but eventually someone came to me and said, you know, I'm getting increasingly uncomfortable uh, with this, and so we, I emailed him behind the scenes. I didn't make a scene out of it. I emailed him behind the scenes and asked him politely if, if he would leave, and he politely agreed. Uh, and I think that worked out best for all parties involved. Um, in IRC, uh, because it is such an immediate medium and because it is such a, a, a really accessible medium, especially for newcomers who wanna be able to come in and say, I'm working on this thing, and it's raising this method missing thing I've never heard of, and what's a nil, and all that stuff, we can answer questions immediately and, and really help people, but as a result, it needs to be absolutely inviting to the noobs. Um, if we have a troll, uh, especially a persistent troll, then they're gonna wind up with a ban, and if they keep it up, they're gonna wind up with a lifetime ban. Uh, most of our bans are 10 minutes long. Um, we start by taking away their voice. If it gets worse, we just kick them out of the room and don't let them back in. Uh, if they persist, we make sure that everyone knows that person's not to be unbanned. Uh, racist remarks, gone. We had someone make a uh, negative remark about a notable trans woman in our community, gone. Um, but much more than the number of bands we've handed out, because there are a limited number of bands that we can hand out, um, we've managed a lot of people's behavior and said, you know, that's not cool, uh, you need to turn this around, and it's worked for the most part. And as a result, we have a very active IRC channel that's very helpful to others. Whatever their motivations are, they want attention. Uh, attention includes you staying in their talk. Uh, it includes the negative reactions. It includes all of it. Uh, it's the whole uh, negative publicity is still publicity thing. So don't feed them. Um, the conference, conference incidents, because we have leaders coming to conferences, they're usually well documented. They usually have a lot of uh, backlash that is loud and volatile. I think in most cases, silent shunning would have worked better. Uh, not always, and I'm not condoning the volatile uh, backlash. I think that it is necessary, uh, and it is certainly communication. Um, but what happens is the backlash's backlash starts up, and it's defensive and often hostile. Uh, in the case of Perform Like a Porn Star, uh, Everything exploded all at once. You could see it on IRC, you could see it on Twitter, blogs. 
the dev chicks manliness, I've been told, I'm not a member. Um, they all exploded at once, uh, pretty furious with this talk. And I think Josh Susser, the, the organizer of Gogoruko, he did a really exceptional job of handling it, but it was post-mortem. And I think that we would have done a better job if we'd shunned it actively. If, if everyone had, who was offended by this talk had stood up and walked out, it can't be argued with. Um, and instead, yeah, whatever, sitting in the audience, self-abuse. Instead, I think that sitting through that talk is, it gives wiggle room to the rationalizations uh, and the defensiveness. And as a result of this talk, the porny presentation bingo card was created. Um, so you could see how many different types of defensive reaction there was to the critique in the first place. Um, but I want to draw out one in particular, lighten up, it was only a joke. Um, there have been a number of cases in just the last couple months where someone did something questionable and someone had the bravery to stand up there and then and say something about it. And they got verbally accosted uh, real time. Um, and I think that's wrong. Basically what you're doing in that case is you're trying to censor criticism and I think that is absolutely wrong. In all cases, I think that criticism, assuming <clears throat> most of it is constructive criticism, should be absolutely encouraged. Um, so for example, in the case of the MongoDB talk, Ruby like a porn star, if the shoe were on the other foot, if you've ever seriously used the word programmer, if the talk wasn't this and was instead this, <laughs> assuming that made you uncomfortable, and if it doesn't, just, just pretend. Assuming that made you uncomfortable, <laughs> you wouldn't accept lighten up, it was only a joke. If you stood up and said, hey, that's wrong, that shouldn't have been done, that's not professional, you wouldn't ever accept that. So why would you accept someone to do it when the shoe's on the first foot in the first place? Further, I think that all the hostility that comes out of these events make us as a community look bad. They make it less inviting for newcomers, regardless of their gender orientation or otherwise. And it prevents us from having fun and helping others. So what's the conclusion? Ruby is what we make of it. And more than that, it's what we make it for others. If we want new blood, fresh blood to come in and bring new ideas and new ways of doing things and crazy talks about prologue and refactoring, if we want those things, then we need to make it inviting. It doesn't take much effort to deal with the undesired behavior, and it doesn't take much to maintain our walled garden. In doing so, make this a better place for all of us. And like last year, this clicker is getting weird. Like last year, I have one more thing. Um, last year, for those who weren't here, um, I encouraged everyone to throw their pre-ground black pepper out and to buy fresh black pepper because if there's anything that'll improve your life, it's that. <laughs> this year, I have version 1.5 of my ginger beer recipe. Um, I like my ginger and I like it strong, so that's a bit much. You might want to scale it back for your first batch. Um, but this has gone through five iterations and is delicious. It will be on my website. Um, thank you. And for those that I offended, I'm sorry. <laughs>